these uh, real stars. And uh, Rob Jeffries is uh, going to tell us about the ages of stars, which is uh, certainly going to touch on some of the controversies that have uh, been raised already during uh, Amy's talk. So. Okay, good morning. My, what a lot of people there are out there. Um, uh, thanks very much to the organizers for choosing our particular topic for this talk. Um, so I've, I've never given a talk in a theater before. I see uh, lots of people over there in the, in the cheap seats with the restricted view. Uh, there's, of course, the royal balcony up here. <laughs> and uh, I, I'll let you decide who is Statler and who is Waldorf up there. OK, so um, uh, he here are my uh, collaborators. So I should say I'm Rob Jeffries, for those of you who don't know me, and these are the people that I've worked with. Uh, you shouldn't take the coincidence of our names with these uh, five bright stars, bright young stars in the Pleiades to suggest. We're not suggesting that we are bright stars. Uh, and sadly, uh, none of us is getting any younger, uh, except for, for Doug here, I think, is perhaps getting younger. OK, so uh, we can measure the masses and radii uh, of stars, but, but we can't measure their ages. Um, we only have a very precise and absolutely uh, correct age for one star. That's the sun. And the reason that we can do that is that we have direct access to solar system material. Uh, for no other star do we have that luxury. Now, the ages of stars, of course, matter. Uh, matter to a lot of people out there. Um, you can think in the context of this meeting uh, that we want to study the, uh, the dispersion of circumstellar material. We want to know what the uh, time scales are for the, um, uh, the formation of planets and stars and clusters. Any talk on uh, stellar ages potentially encompasses uh, a vast amount of material. Uh, an entire IAU symposium uh, was dedicated to this topic in uh, 2008. Uh, this review uh, that I'm doing here is going to focus on estimating the ages of stars during the first 100 million years or so of their lives. Uh, say, the age of the, the Pleiades, in fact, uh, or younger. Uh, at these ages, solar-type stars will have uh, reached the zero-age main sequence. More massive stars will have evolved away from the, uh, or starting their evolution away from the main sequence. But the least massive stars are still on the pre-main sequence, as, of course, by definition of brown dwarfs. Uh, so our primary goal here is to estimate ages independently of the phenomena that we wish to study. Um, that necessarily means that you're going to need lots of different ways of estimating uh, ages that can be uh, tested for self-consistency. And ideally, they would be uh, externally calibrated uh, using, uh, some, you know, in some model independent way. Um, it will also be the case that different age estimation techniques will be ap applicable for different age groups of stars, and also probably different masses. Some methods are going to work OK for, for single stars. Most methods will work best or better uh, in clusters. Uh, and, of course, clusters are key in this whole process because they provide a way of cross-checking the different methods, uh, uh, providing uh, fiducial points for calibration. Uh, a confusing issue is the possibility of spreads of age within a cluster, and uh, uh, we looked at that too. So what can we hope to do? Well, there are broadly four uh, levels at which you might choose to uh, or claim that you can estimate the age of a star. Uh, firstly, we might categorize objects. So we might be able to say they're pre-main sequence, or on the ZAMs, or younger, or older than 10 million years or so, or something like that, or compare them to uh, a cluster of known age. The second level will be that we can put stars uh, in order of their age. We can rank them. Um, so we could be clear about the sequence of events, but we wouldn't necessarily know what the separation of those events uh, were. 
Uh, we could say perhaps what the age differences were, or perhaps if we're working in logarithmic space, what the age ratios were of stars. Uh, but we would have to accept that the age scale itself might be somewhat elastic, might have zero point errors, or could be affected by scale factors. And then finally, and most desirably and most difficult, uh, you know, the thing that is most difficult is that we could tie down the absolute ages of uh, stars. Now, there are a hierarchy of methods uh, that I'm going to go through. Firstly, we've got the, uh, the fundamental techniques. So these are our sort of radiometric uh, techniques that we can use in the solar system. All the physics is known and understood. All the necessary uh, measurements are available. Unfortunately, no such technique exists for distant stars. So we can't use those. We then move on to what I would call semi-fundamental techniques. So these are things where the physics is well understood. Um, there are few assumptions made, and those that are, are unimportant. There's a great deal of model independence here. Then we've got the model dependent ages. So these rely on physics too, of course, but this is physics with uncertainties. So the uncertainties are such that these methods won't yield an absolute age, but they must be calibrated using one of the methods uh, from above. Then we move down to our, our sort of next category would be the empirical ages. So this is where we measure a phenomenon that changes with age, um, and we calibrate that in some way, and then we invert that calibration to yield estimates of ages for other stars. Um, here, well, the physics might only suggest a functional form for that relationship, but there will be free parameters that need to be uh, calibrated. And then finally, there are statistical methods, such as uh, the metallicities of stars or their, or their broad kinematics. Uh, these are not going to be useful in the young stars that we're talking about today. So let's turn first to um, the first, what I would call, semi-fundamental method. This is the so-called lithium depletion boundary. Um, as a pre-main star contracts, its interior gets hot, uh, and eventually it becomes hot enough to burn lithium in P-alpha reactions at about uh, 3 million degrees or so. Now, the fully convective nature of these stars means that that material, that lithium-depleted material, is going to be quickly mixed up to the surface, and rapid lithium depletion through the entire star uh, ensues very quickly. Uh, the signature of lithium depletion is readily tracked. Uh, there is a, a resonance feature of neutral lithium at 6,708 angstroms, uh, which is uh, you know, relatively easily uh, measured with intermediate resolution spectroscopy. And so uh, this depletion of lithium is something that we can uh, measure quite well. Now, the reason that this is a, a semi-fundamental uh, method is there is extremely good agreement between different models about the luminosity at which this lithium depletion boundary uh, uh, occurs. In fact, people have done theoretical experiments varying the input physics with implausible bounds and found, find that the luminosity at which lithium rem remains unburned um, is such that any age uncertainties associated with it, systematic age uncertainties, are at the level of five uh, to less than 10%, really. Just to uh, reinforce that, so the plot on the left here shows the luminosity at which lithium is depleted by 99% in the stellar photosphere uh, against age. And these are several popular models that are on the market. And you can see that they agree extremely well uh, in terms of what, uh, what that luminosity might be uh, at a given age. So this is model insensitive over this sort of range, 20 to 200 million years. Um, below that age, some models, well, there's more disagreement between the models, perhaps 30%. And even some models don't, don't uh, or suggest that there won't be any lithium depletion at all. Uh, above 200 million years, it just becomes observationally extremely difficult to measure the lithium depletion boundary. Uh, that's because the objects that we're measuring here become extremely faint. So we're really pushing at what's possible with eight-meter telescopes at the moment. It will take a step change in instrumentation 
to go uh, to 200 million years and beyond. Uh, just a word of caution, the temperature at which lithium depletion, uh, the, lithium, the lithium depletion boundary as defined using a temperature is not a good age indicator. Uh, this is because it's very difficult to measure the effective temperature of a star. Uh, it's also the case that uh, the different models really don't agree uh, at what that temperature should be at levels which are important in terms of, their, uh, in terms of the observational uncertainties. Okay, here is an example of measuring the lithium depletion boundary. It's one of the best examples, of course. That's why you, uh, that's why you, why you choose particular examples. Uh, these are lines of constant luminosity in a color magnitude diagram. And we have stars up here with no lithium, stars here with lithium. And you can see there's a fairly sharp uh, change from one to the other. The box marks the location of where we think the lithium depletion boundary is. So this requires good spectroscopy and photometry of faint stars. Um, the reason the lithium depletion boundary has uh, any uncertainties at all, really, observationally, is simply the difficulty of locating this box when low mass stars are variable. And also, we may, be, uh, we may have our, uh, unresolved binaries in our sample. And there are eight clusters now that have a measured lithium depletion boundary uh, between the ages of 22 and 132 million years. So this provides a good basis for an absolute age calibration, which you can check then um, other age estimation methods in the same clusters to see whether they uh, agree with the lithium de depletion boundary ages. So the lithium depletion boundary age works down to about 20 million years or so, but what about below that? Well, one possibility that's been explored is that we might use what I call kinematic ages to uh, estimate uh, ages which are reasonably independent. Well, they are independent of stellar physics. They simply rely on tracing back the motions of stars in an attempt to locate their origins or to locate the times at which they were in a very small volume. So there are various different flavors of this, the so-called traceback ages, uh, where you're looking at, uh, say, members of a moving group and trying to find how long ago they occupied some small volume or smallest volume. Uh, then you have expansion ages where you're looking for the relationship between uh, the position of a star and its velocity. If you get some sort of linear trend, then you can invert the gradient of that to give you the age when all this expansion comes together. It's a bit like using the Hubble constant to find the, uh, the age of the universe. Then we have flyby ages. So this is where you're, you're looking at um, the, the time when an object is closest to the centroid of some group uh, that, it, uh, that it possibly belongs to. And then finally, we have what we call the runaway ages. So this is where you identify objects which have been ejected from some birthplace. And of course, um, with this and uh, with the other kinematic uh, age estimation methods, you're assuming that that age is pretty close to the age when the stars were born. I mean, strictly speaking, these ages are lower limits, uh, I suppose. Now, needless to say, although conceptually simple, these, uh, these methods require excellent uh, astrometry. Remember, as a rule of thumb, uh, an error of one kilometer a second in a velocity translates into an error in position of one parsec every million years that you trace back. So this is a famous example. This is the Beta Pick moving group. Um, so in uh, 2003, uh, Song uh, showed this very uh, well-known plot. So here are the Beta Pick uh, members now in the XY plane of the galaxy. And then if you trace their motions back, the idea is that 12 million years ago, they occupied a much smaller volume. But there's two things to notice about this uh, plot. One is that this volume here that they trace back to is still very large, actually. It's 40 parsecs across. Now, only some of that can be explained by observational errors. And one has to ask, well, you know, if you've got a bunch of stars covering an area, a volume of like 40 parsecs, is there any reason to expect that those stars are coeval to begin with? Um, perhaps not. Uh, and also notice that you've actually had to throw some stars away. So there's a certain amount of selectivity and subjectivity to um, applying this technique, um, which I think is a major problem. In fact, one of our, uh, one of our uh, 
our gang, one of our group, uh, um, has looked at uh, the beta pic data again using the revised Hipparchus astrometry and finds actually that there's very little evidence that the group was smaller uh, in the past, well, certainly at uh, 12 million years ago. And in fact, the expansion rate is inconsistent with a 12 million year age at a sort of three sigma uh, level of uncertainty. Now, partly this hinges on you know, which stars you choose to include in that moving group. So necessarily, there will always be that element of subjectivity. Now, of course, this might all change when we have access to Gaia results, where we have you know, very you know, pinpoint sharp, accurate astrometry for, for these stars, and hopefully accurate radial velocities as well from uh, other means. And then, well, this method might work. But at the moment, there, is this, there are these problems um, associated with the technique. The same thing applies, or a related problem applies to runaways. I mean, with runaways, you've got to, you've got to pinpoint where they've come from. So there's a famous example in, in or was possibly a, a runaway from the Orion Nebula cluster two and a half million years ago. Now, the problem with that is that actually the location is not that well pinpointed. And so uh, in the last year or so, Alves and Bowie have noted that there is this uh, foreground cluster to the ONC, not very far away from it in, in, in terms of its direction. It could well be that that runaway has come from that cluster, not from the ONC at all. So you really have to be absolutely sure where the runaways are coming from. And again, Gaia will help enormously because not only will you be able to pinpoint the location origins of runaways very, very closely, but you'll be able to find lower mass runaways, more runaways. Um, OK, so now I'm going to turn to uh, what I would characterize as model-dependent methods. And the first of these is, of course, uh, fitting isochrones to data. Um, the ages for young populations can be found both from uh, the way that stars evolve away from the ZAMs towards the terminal age main sequence and then beyond the main sequence turn off and beyond. But the lower mass stars, of course, can be aged because they're descending Hayashi tracks and approaching the zero age main sequence. Now, of course, a distance is required to put stars on a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. If you're dealing with single stars, well, that means you need a parallax or something like that. If you're dealing with clusters of stars, then, of course, you have this very convenient zero age main sequence that you can fit at the same time. So the data gives you both the, the distance and the age in principle. Now, with both high and low mass isochrones, you have choices and problems. The main choice that you have to make is whether to fit things in the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram in other words, in the, in the theoretical plane, or in, say, a color magnitude diagram, in the plane in which the observations are taken. Now, the advantage to fitting in the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram is if you have stars which have accretion or veiling or individual, different, you know, individual extinctions, then you can place those individually on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. The disadvantage to that is, of course, that if you're trying to develop some statistical way of fitting these isochrones, you've got some horrible correlation between the, ax between the coordinates on each axis if you do that. On the other hand, if you, if you go to the color magnitude diagram, well, of course, that means you've got to transform the theoretical isochrones into the observational plane, um, which then requires, well, you know, relationships between temperature and color and uh, bolometric, uh, bolometric corrections in effective temperature and so on. These techniques are, of course, susceptible. They suffer from physical uncertainties. That's why they're model uh, dependent. So looking first at the high mass isochrones, the main uncertainties here are things like rotation and the amount of overshooting that you have from the convective uh, core. Uh, um, and both of these things act to increase main sequence lifetimes for, uh, for, for stars, for high mass stars. Now, these are some uh, isochrones taken from the most recent Geneva models published by uh, Ekstrom. And you can see these are the differences between isochrones, these are isochrones, not tracks, uh, between non-rotating models and models that rotate at around, uh, I forget the exact number, half, half breakup speed, something like that. And you can see that there are differences. In fact, 
age is determined from, say, the, the, the position of the main sequence turnoff here would be affected at, at the level of about 30%. Uh, depending on uh, whether you chose a rotating or non-rotating model. However, the transition from zero age main sequence to terminal age main sequence is much, much less affected. And of course, you have more stars in this region, right? Very few stars up here because of the shape of the mass function. Here's an example of fitting that upper main sequence uh, uh, that I want to show you. And of course, again, this is a very good example that I'm showing you. So this is the zero age main sequence uh, on a color magnitude diagram, V versus B minus V. And, and underneath here is a two-dimensional model. So this is a model which includes observational uncertainties. And it includes, of course, binaries too. That's very important. Now, um, a zero age, well, a 0.25 million year uh, model is, a, is actually a, statistically a poor fit to the zero age main to that. On the other hand, if we allow the age to go free, you can see that this curvature up here, as stars move towards the terminal age main sequence, enables, to get, enables us to get an age and also some reliable uncertainties. I'll just flick backwards and forwards between those two a couple of times. Now, this is a good example that I've picked. We've got lots of stars here to constrain the fit. Normally, you have very few stars in this region, and that means that often the statistical uncertainties in an upper main sequence age are actually rather larger than the systematic uncertainties. Here's a comparison of upper main sequence ages with lithium depletion boundary ages for, for, for clusters where that's available. Now, one lesson that we draw straight away from this plot is that models which don't include any core overshooting or rotation are actually a rather poor uh, match to the lithium depletion boundary ages, which we believe to be the best bet at the moment for an absolute age scale. The models that feature overshoot, or indeed we can swap between overshoot and rotation, or a, or a bit of both, do a much better job of giving us a nice one-to-one -one relationship between the lithium depletion boundary ages and upper main sequence ages. Now, going down to lower masses and ages from the pre-main sequence, well, pre-main sequence isochrones can, of course, be used to estimate ages, uh, at least below some mass where the pre-main sequence turns on to the zero age main sequence. Again, you have choices. If there is differential extinction or accretion that we want to deal with with individual stars, then probably it's best to use the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. If we don't, then probably the best thing to do is to use the color magnitude uh, diagram. Here is, um, well, this is a typical example, actually. So this is the Orion Nebula cluster. And you put proper motion selected low mass stars onto the color magnitude diagram after correcting for extinction. Um, spectroscopy is invaluable here to place stars on the, color on, the, uh, on the HR diagram. To get the effective temperatures, you really need um, spectroscopy. Spectroscopy and a color will also give you the extinction. You see there's a very widespread in luminosities here. Now, there are lots of candidates for what might cause that spread in luminosity. You're, of course, errors associated with extinction, with accretion. There might be, uh, of course, a genuine age spread. There's also variability. And inevitably, there's binarity. Now, of course, you could just uh, argue, well, I'll just, I'll just draw a line through the middle of these things and take that as the age. Some of these uncertainties are asymmetric. So you would actually get a biased, a biased age, for instance, if you ignored the fact that many of these stars are unresolved uh, binaries. This is not restricted to nearby clusters. As observational techniques have got better, we, we see actually, even when we look at uh, really superstar clusters in, um, in our own galaxy, or even uh, clusters in the large Magellanic Cloud, like this one here, these uh, luminosity spreads, possibly age spreads, are ubiquitous. So it raises these two questions. Are the spreads in luminosity real? Do they imply real age spreads? And of course, the consequences 
of, uh, of these things are very important if you want to try and estimate ages. I mean, on the one hand, if the spreads in luminosity um, are real and, uh, and the age spreads are real, that implies that you can't use a young cluster as a fiducial age point because it doesn't have one age. It has a wide spread of ages. On the other hand, if the luminosities are due to, say, uncertainties, if this spread in luminosity is just down to observational uncertainties, it means the ages that you get for individual stars from the Hertzsprung-Russell diagrams are, are hopeless, right? They have errors of something like 0.4 or 0.5 dex in log age, factors of three errors. Now, in some cases, observational uncertainties may explain the luminosity spreads, but in other cases, in cases where this is really carefully looked at, it seems that that isn't going to be true. So this is an example from Reggiani et al. Uh, we see um, the various contributions to the luminosity spread, uh, a pseudo-Gaussian luminosity spread, and all these things add up to about 0.1 dex in log luminosity. This translates to an age spread of only about 0.15 to 0.2 dex, much smaller than the observed age spread, the inferred age spread. So it may be that the uncertainties cannot explain this spread, in which case we're left with two options. Either the age spread is real, or it may be something to do with the fact that the position of a star on the Hertz from Russell diagram more reflects what happened in its prior history it's accretion history when it was in the class one phase, which we've just heard about. That would be a disaster for estimating ages from the Hertzsprung Russell diagram, right? It would mean essentially that the ages were meaningless if that latter possibility were true. Fortunately, that scatter diminishes. Once stars get older, older than about 10 million years, and they lose their disks, the scatter in the Hertzsprung Russell diagram gets much, much smaller. This means that we can rank groups of stars at different ages with, with some degree of confidence, actually. But there are systematic problems at all ages in terms of deciding whether those, are, you know, those ages are absolutely correct or not. For instance, it's well known that model isochrones, so these are different model isochrones uh, in the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, they simply just do not agree on the ages of stars. So if you think about stars A, C, and B here, or A, B, and C, the ages that you get for those stars from different isochrones vary by factors of two, and not in a systematic way. It depends, it depends which temperature range you're in as to which one gives you the youngest age or the oldest age. Furthermore, um, if, we deal with our, if we look at sort of model isochrones, so these are um, isochrones which have self-consistent atmospheres and predict the colors and magnitudes of the stars, we still find that there is a discrepancy in the most useful optical colors between what we observe in the color magnitude diagram and what the models predict. And these, I mean, you just have to do some kind of empirical tuning to actually correct the bolometric corrections so that they, so that they match, you know, a cluster, well, this is the Pleiades, right? So that they match the Pleiades. So this is a major source of uncertainty. However, you know, there are reasons to be cheerful. Here is some recent work, uh, and there's a poster on this uh, by Bell et al. comparing pre-main sequence and upper main sequence ages. And for some uh, pre-main sequence models, there is actually pretty good agreement here between the upper main sequence and pre-main sequence ages. One point to make is, of course, this might be entirely fortuitous. For instance, what happens if high mass stars are formed after low mass stars. I mean, we wouldn't expect them to be the same age, right? So there's a, there's a possibility. I mean, what I want to, uh, I want you to note as well that the, the, the highest age object here has a lithium depletion boundary age, which agrees pretty well. So what I want you to imagine is there's, a, there's like a piece of elastic that's pinned here at about 20 million years, but you can stretch it in a variety of ways at ages below that. So even though you might get the clusters in the right order, the spacing between them is uh, very, very uncertain, maybe by a factor of two. Now, there are some other model-dependent ways that you could go at this. Um, 
A very promising technique is uh, astroseismology. I mean, unfortunately, the P modes that have been measured by Kepler in some older solar type stars are really inaccessible in these young stars. And that's because they're just very variable. I mean, you, there's just so much intrinsic variability that you can't hope to identify uh, these P modes. But some pre main sequence stars actually pass through the delta scuti instability strip. And so you might hope to see oscillations uh, there, pulsations. Um, there are also, uh, there's a, a theoretical brown dwarf instability strip uh, involving deuterium burning, which has not been observed yet. Uh, there are some early results on uh, these delta scuti type variables. So what I'm showing you here is a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram where um, this error bar here is the position of the thing in the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram that you get from observations. These are best fitting, well, they are models which give acceptable fits uh, to the pulsation spectrum. And uh, the best fitting pulsation models actually give an age that's more precise. So it agrees generally with the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram age, but more precise. It would be really good if you could get a set of stars in a cluster in this instability strip might allow you to say something about the age spreads. Gravity diagnostics are also very useful. Um, there's a poster here by uh, Simon Murphy, which actually gives a better diagram than this, which shows that there are spectroscopic diagnostics of gravity, which can enable you to separate stars into their uh, rank orders. Again, the models are too uncertain here to say that you've got a, um, an absolute age, but certainly clusters can be put into order between about 5 and 20 million years um, with a resolution probably of a few million years if you have plenty of stars in the group you're dealing with. Uh, the radiative convective gap is another possibility that's yet to be explored. Uh, if you look at the color magnitude diagram of a long, young cluster, there is this transition region, this gap between stars on the pre-main sequence and stars on the zero-age main sequence. So stars scoot through that region of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram very quickly and leave a gap. If you could measure this gap in clusters, it would give you a distance. So the width of that gap would give you a distance and the extinction independent means of estimating their age out to around 15 million years or so when the gap essentially closes up. Now moving on to uh, uh, less favored uh, age indicators. So rotation and activity might, you know, gyrochronology probably works quite well for older stars. For younger stars, I'm afraid it's next to useless, right? There is this very large spread in rotation rates as we go out to about 100 million years. And the medians here, these are the green symbols, really don't vary by very much compared to the enormous scatter that you see here. So measuring the rotation rate, certainly of a solar mass star, is not going to tell you very much about its age uh, below ages of 100 million years. The same is true, of course, of activity, because activity is closely related to rotation. And so measuring activity indicators in this range really isn't going to directly tell you what the age of a star is. There is some hope, perhaps, in lower mass stars. So in lower mass stars, uh, you do see that the rotation period distribution actually does vary. It does change. It evolves as you go to lower mass stars. And Henderson and Stassen have suggested that the slope of this, um, this cutoff, this, this ramping down of rotation periods in the lowest mass stars might actually give you a way of ordering clusters below 10 million years or so. But I guess I would argue if you had that many stars that you could do that, well, why not just use the pre-main sequence isochrones to do the ordering for you? Disk presence. Well, some people do use disk presence as an independent clock. This is a, you know, there are lots of uh, relationships like that you can see in the literature. Potentially, you could invert that to give you an age. It might give you uh, an age accurate to about 50% or so. Of course, what you've got to remember here is each one of these points is a whole cluster, which may contain different environments. Until we understand really well what happens to disks and why they disperse, you're always taking a big risk by using this as an age indicator for a group of stars, 
let alone a single star. As we heard somebody comment that you have um, disks with stars which are maybe very young, less than a million years old. Uh, some stars less than a million years, years old that seem to have lost their disks. And you also have stars older than 15 million years, older than 10 million years old, which still retain disks. So always a big risk if you're going to use this to, um, to, to estimate ages. And of course, you're completely at the mercy here of what age scale you've used to calibrate the ages of these clusters in the first place. Lithium depletion. Well, lithium depletion in F, G, and K stars is also aged in independent. What I'm showing you here is some models of that lithium depletion. Um, we've got isochrones of lithium depletion here. So this is the fraction of lithium that's left versus effective temperature. Uh, we've got two ages here, 20 million years, 200 million years. And then the green line shows the same ages, 20 and 200 million years, but for a model which simply uses a different mixing length, a different efficiency of convection. This is why this is never going to give you, it's not going to be an absolute age indicator. The models just vary tremendously by orders of magnitude over of the lithium depletion that they predict at a given age. So you're never going to be able to use this sort of lithium depletion as an absolute age indicator. But that doesn't prevent us from trying to use it as an empirical age indicator. So we can look at, say, the equivalent width of that lithium 6708 feature against color. And we can show stars in clusters, fiducial calibrated clusters, at different ages. And we see that there is a progression with age that we could use as an age indicator. In particular, I point out that there is a major change in the lithium abundance in M late K and M-type dwarfs as they age between 10 and 50 million years. Now, of course, you could use that, but notice also that we get big scatters developing here. This is probably scatters which are due to, well, it's certainly due to sort of non-standard mixing, right? Could be extra rotational mixing, could be magnetic fields, suppression convection, lots of things it could be. But it's basically a nuisance if you want to try and use lithium as an empirical age indicator. And the best you could probably hope to do is a factor of two. OK, so now I'm going to just summarize the key points of what I've said. Um, firstly, uh, let's start off with the positives. The lithium depletion boundary age. It works well for 20 to 200 million years. We think that it's very model independent and very robust to the physics that go into the models. And it gives ages that are precise to 10% and maybe also accurate to 10% too. So this establishes a set of calibration clusters. The only problem with it is, is it takes a heck of a lot of telescope time to actually get even one of these lithium depletion boundary measurements. And there aren't too many more clusters available that we can do with 8-meter telescopes. Kinematics. Well, we can't recommend that you use kinematics to give you what you think is some sort of model independent age. There are problems with the precision of the data that's available at the moment. There are also these almost philosophical issues about subjective choice of which stars are members of groups and which ones aren't, and tracing them back from that point of view. Runaways, the problem there is locating precisely what the origin is. And of course, needless to say, like many, uh, you know, Gaia will help, that's for sure. The model dependent ages, well, you've kind of got two faces of the coin here. The upper main sequence ages have large statistical uncertainties, because you haven't got very many stars to fit, but probably quite modest systematic uncertainties, maybe 30% or so. With the pre-main sequence ages, it's the other way around. You can get great precision, because you've got hundreds of pre-main sequence stars you can place in the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, but the absolute accuracy of those models is still maybe factors of two or three at ages less than 10 million years. Older than that, things get a bit better, and you can certainly rank stars in age order very well. Uh, age spreads are, of course, a complicating factor here, below 10 million years. Uh, the pulsations, radio to convective gap, gravity indicators, they all show promise at being able to order clusters. And they are distance independent, so that's, that's quite good. Um, I, I daren't even say it, but you know, suppose Gaia blew up on the launch pad, right? We, we, 
We may need those distance independent methods. <laughs> Finally, the empirical ages. Well, lithium is sensitive to uh, late K and M dwarfs uh, over a range 10 to 100 million years. You might get factors of two precision in an age for one star, not absolute ages. Disc precision, disc, discs and accretion, well, caveat emptor, right? We don't understand why discs and how discs disperse. You're always taking a big risk. But if you're willing to take that risk, maybe you get a 50% precision between ages of 1 and 15 million years. Rotation and activity, hopeless. And a final thought. So remember this, this elastic band that I talked about. Right? So we have a way of estimating absolute ages down to about 20 million years, the lithium depletion boundary here. But there's a great big hole here where we don't know what absolute ages are, and we can stretch that elastic band in various ways, maybe by a factor of two. Wouldn't it be great if we had an absolute age indicator that we could slot in there? Well, kinematics, particularly runaways, might come to the rescue if Gaia fulfills the, the, the promise that we all hope it will. But in the meantime, here's a thought. There should be a deuterium depletion boundary in much the same way that there's a lithium depletion boundary. Deuterium burns at much lower temperatures, and so the luminosity at which deuterium is depleted from a star's, well, a brown dwarf's photosphere, actually, um, is age-dependent, very age-dependent, and hopefully very model-robust in the same way that the lithium depletion boundary ages. And that might give us, if we could measure, for instance, the presence or not of deuterated molecules in the atmosphere of a brown dwarf, that might give us a deuterium depletion boundary age that we could be confident of. Thank you very much. Thanks very much uh, for a very uh, clear talk. First question, and then we go there. Yeah, Günther. Yes, it's on. Günther Wuchtel uh, from Coro at Tartenburg Observatory. First of all, thank you, thank you, thank you, and you and your team for this most enjoyable 45 minutes on ages. Let me give you one footnote on the Isotopic, isotopically or lithium deuterium driven indicators and their class of their own in terms of model independence. The model independence of both of those indicators stems from a consensus about the initial conditions used in premium sequence calculations. If you follow Hayashi's paradigma, you get the consensus. If you try to follow the collapse, the consensus is gone. So having said that, let me ask you a question. You have all these nice age scales. Uh, where's the zero point? Sorry, where's the? Zero point. Zero, oh, the point. zero point. Well, of course, the zero point matters, um, certainly at ages less than a few million years. And um, Isabel Baraf wrote a paper in 2002 pointing out that you know, even their models, you shouldn't really take the ages too seriously when you get down to you know, ages of one or two million years, because there are significant uncertainties in where you draw the, the zero point. Of course, the, the traditional thing is to use a, like a, a, a birth line, you know, deuterium burning birth line. But I mean, if these things we've seen about early accretion are true, that idea goes out of the window, and there, there, is, no, uh, there is no single birth line that you can apply to, uh, to stars uh, at all. Um, coming back to your, um, your first point about the model independence, um, I would think, actually, that uh, certainly for the lithium depletion boundary, that the star more or less forgets about those initial conditions after 20 million years or so. So, I mean, if, if you haven't depleted lithium uh, during those initial conditions, which, um, well, I could go back, but we can see in pre-main sequence associations that you know, there is no lithium depletion, uh, then I think you can be pretty confident that this, by the time you get beyond ages of 20 million years, that the, the star has forgotten about its initial conditions. And so Hayashi's consensus, we, I think we <laughs> hope, is, uh, is okay. Okay, thanks, uh, Eric. 
Hey, Rob, just a uh, uh, comment. State your course. name, please. Oh, Eric Mimicek, University of Rochester. So just a comment and a question. Of Don't you dare comment. disagree about something now. I agree with everything you said. No, actually I don't. But uh, so my comment is just, just, just another takeaway message, and this goes back to Amy's talk also. When, if, if you accept this new age scale, the lithium depletion ages are now agreeing with the upper main sequence ages. If you now rescale the ages of these clusters, the half-life for the Titori stars is now more like three and possibly four million years. Yeah. So this is adding to that calculation she's talking about. This is, this is adding 50, more than 50% to the, um, the ages of those CTTs. Uh, my question is, what does, a, what does the observing proposal look like for trying to measure the deuterium burning uh, boundary. That's just a fascinating. I don't know how the heck you could do it. No, no, I'm not. I'm not clear how you would do Anything it either. Actually, in the next two um, centuries. I mean, there are there are um, you know there have been suggestions that you might try and find deuterated water uh, molecules in the in the sort of infrared. Um, there are also uh, there is a paper by Yakov Pavlenko who suggested that you might be able to find. Uh, now I'm not I'm not actually clear what the right word. Uh, What's the equivalent of, of chromium hydride for deuterium? Would you say chromium deuteride? I, I'm not. So, um, and that's that's sort of in the in the um, the near infrared um, suggested as possible diagnostics, um, mainly associated with the idea that you might be able to separate planets from stars, you know, by by looking at whether they're above or below the deuterium boundary. But this is the same sort of problem. Um, so no, I don't. I don't, I don't really at this stage have any clue as to whether this is even remotely feasible. Well, if it can, if it can be done with a CAC, we should do it. I, I was thinking that that maybe it would require JWST or something, but. Any questions from the top? Yes, go ahead. Uh, Ian Crossfield, MPIA. You showed us that uh, gyrochronology is effectively useless for dating younger stars. Can you explain then why it is useful at all for older stars? Uh, OK, it's useful for older stars because over in this uninteresting portion of the diagram here, which is, of course, all compressed up on a logarithmic scale, you can see, uh, uh, well, you can see that these models all converge. Uh, and in fact, the data do as well, right? I, I haven't actually got all the data on there for older stars. So that, that's the point, is that you get a more one-to-one um, uh, -one relationship between rotation and, and uh, age at older ages, say beyond the age of the Hyades, basically. And how is it, how is it that that converges from this huge scatter we see here? How, how does it happen? It's because the angular momentum loss rate actually depends on rotation. So the faster, the faster rotators lose more angular momentum, and so the, the whole distribution converges. Yes, uh, Joel Kastner. Hi, Rob, from the Cheap Seats. The, yeah. a, a, as a, one of the three present or former Zuckerman students here in the audience, I guess I feel, and, and as the most senior one, I feel compelled to <laughs> slightly defend the, the beta pick age. I think if Ben were here, and I take a great risk in speaking for him, of course, yeah. um, I think he would say that, that it's, it's the self-consistency between the, the different age diagnostics that brings us to an age of roughly 12 mega years for beta pick in particular. And uh, yeah, isochronal ages, lithium depletion. Right, th th those, are, those are statistical errors. Right, right, and, and granted, and I, I, I would not be, want to claim that we know the age of the beta pick group, I think, to better than you know, plus or minus yeah. five million years, as sort of is up, up there. But I think it's, it's, it is slightly pessimistic to say throw away kinematics as, as uh, or d disregard kinematics right now. It, you know, I'd point people to the, to the poster by David Rodriguez on using kinematics at least as one, a kinematics and activity in fact, as, as two of, of several indicators that can close in on additional members of known moving groups. And then you need to use the, 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 sorts of, the other sorts of more um, reliable techniques like lithium depletion and so on you were talking about. Yeah. Would you agree that it's, it's, it's really the yeah. self-consistency that we need to use between these methods to get anywhere right well, now? Well, uh, the trouble is that self-consistency can lead you you know, lead you along the wrong path, right? So for instance, there's a level of subjectivity here. You, you have to concede that. There's a level of su subjectivity in excluding certain objects, right? Now the problem is, what stops you from excluding objects because you get a nice 12 million year old age if you exclude these objects, but you get some different age if you, if you exclude a different set of objects. 
So, so, let's, so, uh, so there's a danger there. Let's uh, keep the discussion at that. Both points well taken. Uh, John. Uh, John Tobin, NRAO. I was, going back to the Reggiani work on Orion, I was wondering, was that taken from a specific sub-region of Orion, or was that uh, the whole central region of Orion integrated together? Um, I, I, I don't know chapter and verse on that. It is basically the Orion Nebula Cluster, and, and I, I think mostly is, uh, most of this is covered by the HST Treasury Program, which there is a, there's a poster on that up there somewhere. Okay, so, so do, you, do you think maybe this is evidence for multiple bursts of star formation oh, okay. in Orion. Right, I know, what, yeah, I, I know where you're coming from now. Okay, so there is this foreground population discovered by Alves and Bowie, uh, well, rediscovered by Alves and Bowie. I, I don't think it's, in, well, in fact, we've done this experiment, right? If you take out all the low extinction stars, th this looks exactly the same. So, so we don't think there's, uh, I mean, contamination is always a possibility, right? There's always that possibility. But I don't think it's going to change the overall view that in most discrete, if we can put it that, if I can call it a star-forming region discrete, you get this large apparent age spread. Okay, Neil, and then we have one more there and one more there. So then we're done for the, Oh, there's one. Okay, Neil, qu 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 okay. short questions and short answers, please. All right, so I'm, this isn't even a question. I, I just want to make explicit something that's sort of been implicit in some of this discussion, and that is that Everything else we've talked about here are the ages of the uh, class one, class zero stages, the star formation rates, they all depend on this assumption that the scale to the class two, that is the infrared disk, half-life of two million years. And we've always emphasized that's a half-life. If the ages of those clusters are twice as old, the ages of the class one sources get twice as long, the accretion yep. rates you expect go down, and the star formation rates go down. So it always has a tremendous effect, and we rely on this slender read of the ages of these young clusters, and we have to get down to two million years to get ages, or yeah. uh, we, we yeah, don't I, I mean, I mean in, fa in fact, I, I would argue that, that, that even, even, even I'm, I'm not sure where, where the two figure comes from, actually. I mean, three, actually, is a, is a much more conventional, uh, uh, Half-life. <laughs> but if you but, put up your diagram yeah, with the yeah. ages, the disk fraction versus clusters. Yeah, that yeah. one. Uh, if you look at the one over E point, it's about three million. Three. If you look at the half-life, it's half a million. So, or two million. So, yeah, and, and you I, can draw yeah, that line in various places. Yeah, so, yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, it's. <laughs> Certainly two plus or minus one before you guys start changing yeah, the ages. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but, my, but okay. my point is that, yeah, you could, you, you could move this whole thing backwards and forwards by a factor of two, two. and I don't think there's any evidence to, to, to reject that. No. That's a very good point, yeah. Uh, regarding, uh, Ralf Neuhäuser, regarding the, the deuterium depletion boundary, yeah. uh, I have a comment uh, also on Eric yeah. Mamacek's questions. There is a methane line in the thermal infrared which is deteriorated, so with one deuterium atom instead of a normal hydrogen. And we made up the number some years ago with Peter Hauschild. You can detect it in principle uh. with cryos at the VLT, but even for the brightest, youngest, most nearby brown dwarfs, it takes more than one night per object. No, so I, it I, might be a good science case for an ELT. No, I'm, no, I'm, 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 I'm not going to think about this on my feet but I'm pretty sure that you never get de deuterated methane in something near the deuterium boundary, actually. I'm, I'm going to have to come back to you on that. It's too hot, yeah. OK, yeah. Mark. Hi, Mark Crumholz. So I just wanted to go back to the age spread in Orion and other clusters where people have tried to do this and just point out that, all right, when you're getting down to one mega year, you know, sort of one, one-ish mega year ages, you are absolutely going to have an age spread simply because if you go to the Orion Nebula cluster, the crossing time of the Orion Nebula cluster is, you know, three, four hundred thousand years. So even if you believe in the absolute fastest, most efficient possible star formation, everything happens in one crossing time, you get an age spread of five hundred, you know, of approaching five hundred thousand years. And if you don't take that most extreme view, you take a view that star formation is a few crossing times, then you're at that age spread. So, uh, yes, I agree. Yeah. Um, except, notice this is a logarithmic scale, yeah. and you have stars here at ten million years old. So, I mean, that, you know, that's the that's the kind of thing that you want to either rule in or out. Sure, no, no I, I completely I, agree. I, I agree, but it, you know, for the ONC, that's large enough that it's interesting. 
but the <laughs> ONC is sort of the shortest crossing time of all the clusters where people have tried to do this. Other places people have tried to do it, like Taurus, the crossing time is a million years. Well, what about this okay. one? Okay, yeah, I'm afraid we have to leave you there. And just one final question uh, here at the center. We're... Hi, uh, my name is yeah. Kosta Getman, I'm from Penn State. Yeah. And I just would like to advertise my poster. <laughs> 1B029, it's on H uh, analysis of 150 mystic subclusters. <laughs> including Orion, we, and we're finding age gradients in all star-forming regions, including Orion. And please don't be discouraged by, I, I completely agree that uh, <laughs> absolute ages are known for uh, subclusters using, for example, premium sequence techniques. But when you can see the 150 subclusters, you can rank them. Mm -hmm. And, yes, yes. Uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, for, you know, the, the positive message is there are plenty of ways to rank clusters in order. Right. That's that's not and, and that's not a mean. problem. It is a problem for individual stars. Okay, <laughs> let's uh, leave it at that. So one final short comment, very short. Jules Chabot, very short comment on, on Mark's very good point. Right. And as, as you perfectly know, Rob, I mean, there is no way you can get something, even if your models are completely wrong, whatever, <laughs> you, there is no way you can get 10 million year age spread in, in clusters like that just because of the speed of sound, right? But as you perfectly know, as, as Neil have shown and many people, and, and as we've shown with Isabel, I mean, you can really nail, I mean, nail down. I mean, there is no age spread. There is a luminosity spread. I, I, which I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> Time for me to go. Which, which is... Which is very plausibly explained by physical equation. Okay, good. Uh, let's thank uh, Rob again. <laughs>